2024 is shaping up to be the year in which many, many more banks begin to fail. This will result in consolidation of the banking system among just a few very large banks, resulting in ever more concentration of power and more central control over the banking and the financial system. Less choice for you. Now, this has happened many, many times before in the past. There are patterns. We can see these patterns, which is how we can know they're happening again. Despite what they try and tell you every time, this time is not different. And while the overall pattern is the same, the catalyst that triggers it is usually different. Like last time it was mortgage-backed securities, this time it's the commercial real estate collapse. So to understand what is going on right now and how it will play out, let's take a trip back through time and see how this pattern unfolds throughout history. The very first banks were simply gold storage companies. So somebody would have some gold coins, they didn't wanna carry them around with them for fear of getting robbed or they wanted a safe place to store them. So they gave them to a goldsmith usually, those were the original banks, and just said, hey, we'll pay you, keep this safe for me, and at some point, I'll come back and get my gold. A person would be issued a little receipt that said, hey, you can come back at any time and get your one ounce or five ounces or 10 ounces of gold. When the person wanted to make a purchase, they would go get their gold, make the purchase, and eventually these things grew into popularity and more and more people started storing their money there. After a while, this meant that people were no longer going to retrieve their gold to make the purchase. They were just using their little slips of paper, their receipts that gave them the claim on that gold, to make the purchase. Because if I can go use this piece of paper to get an ounce of gold, I can just give you the piece of paper as payment, and then if you wanna go get the gold, you can do that. This system worked out great for a long time, but eventually the banks realized they didn't even have to charge people to store their gold because they had another way to make money. They would simply take the gold that people had entrusted to them and loan it out. Even this arrangement worked out great for a while, but you start to notice a pattern of banks taking on too much leverage, making too many loans, or too risky of loans. And then the depositors would get wind of this, realize, hey, the bank might have trouble getting my gold back. So everybody would go line up to get their gold. There'd be a bank run and the bank would collapse. So this is the pattern that we see all throughout history. Deposits, loans, over leverage, bank run, collapse. A fantastic book detailing this for the last 800 years is called This Time Is Different by Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff. I highly suggest this book. Now, about 300 years ago, in order to try and stop this problem, we had the invention of the central bank. This would be a bank for banks so that if one bank was too risky, made too many loans and started to see a bank run, there would be a bank that could draw from all the other banks in the system to bail that individual bank out. The only problem this solved was individual bank risk, but it actually scaled up the risk to the entire system and you started to have systemic instability as a result of central banks. This is why again in 1913, when the Federal Reserve was established in the United States, our central bank, you had the first Great Depression start just seven years later as a result of the same pattern. Banks took the deposits, made too many loans, too risky of loans, leverage built up in the system, there were bank runs and the system collapsed. If you want a great resource on that, I suggest reading The Forgotten Depression by James Grant, another fantastic book on this topic. But the US and the Fed did not learn their lesson because just nine years after that, they repeated their mistakes. Banks across the United States making too many loans, too risky of loans, leverage built up in the system, bank runs happened and the whole system collapsed again. Now, there was a period of calm for a few decades after this, simply because the rest of the world started using the Federal Reserve as their own central bank. So we had a global central bank now with the Federal Reserve for the first time. But the same exact pattern started to repeat itself. All of those deposits, the central bank started to make too many loans, print too many claims on the amount of money, the gold that they actually had in storage. So leverage built up in the system. The depositors realized their money wasn't actually there, so they started to go and get their gold. And in 1971, the United States was about two weeks away from completely running out of all of its gold there was a bank run going on. It was just a global bank run this time. And that's when Nixon decided to default on its obligation as the bank for the world, closed the gold window and just said, no, we're not giving you your money back. You can keep the paper instead. But it was the same pattern as it's always been. The deposits were made, too many loans and leverage built up in the system, a bank run started, and then there was the collapse. The savings and loan crisis that happened in 1980 was again the exact same pattern. And fast forward to about 15 years ago during the great financial crisis, the same pattern again. Banks took the deposits, made too many and too risky loans, 
this time in the form of mortgage-backed securities, there were bank runs, there was not enough liquidity, the collapse started to happen. If we take a look at the chart of bank failures that happen every single year, we can notice a couple of things that give us some insights onto the pattern unfolding before us right now. Usually prior to a period of instability and collapse, there's about two years of calm, the calm before the storm. This happened in 2005 and in 2006. In 2008, we can see that total assets lost were massive, $373 billion to be exact. However, the total number of bank failures was actually very small at only 25 banks. The subsequent years resulted in smaller and smaller number of assets lost, even though there were higher and higher numbers of total bank failures happening. Essentially, the big boys with the most assets get wiped out at the beginning, and following that, you have the carnage spread to the rest of the banking system with smaller and smaller banks failing, and they're smaller banks, so there's less assets. But there's still more bank failures. As a result of the years following the great financial crisis, we saw a massive consolidation in the banking system as the larger banks absorbed all of the assets and liabilities from the rest of the banking system, resulting in fewer banks, more concentration, more control over the financial system. 2021 and 2022 were years that mirrored 2005 and 2006 as a calm before a storm with zero failures. However, 2023 is a mirror of 2008 with a massive record-breaking number of assets lost, $548 billion, with only five bank failures. As the trouble hits the rest of the financial system much more slowly, 2024 and the subsequent years will likely be years in which more and more small banks will fail, even though it's a smaller number of assets, and then all of those assets and liabilities will get absorbed by the rest of the banking system, meaning more consolidation, fewer banks, easier central control over the entire financial system. System. So that's the pattern that we see unfolding throughout history. Is there any evidence though of things happening with banks today that would give us reason to think that more small banks are at risk of failure and the large banks will absorb them? Well, if we take a look at this data from EPB research, we can see that large commercial banks only have about 7% of their loans exposed to commercial real estate, whereas small commercial banks have about 30% of their loans in commercial real estate. Beyond that, large commercial banks have been decreasing their exposure to loans as a percent of their assets for years now, which means that small commercial banks have been picking up the slack as loans have been making a larger and larger percentage of their balance sheets. Okay, so small banks have more exposure to commercial real estate loans, but does that actually mean they're at more risk? Today, more and more people are waking up to the fact that commercial real estate is facing what some are calling an existential crisis. Billionaire Barry Sternlight, who founded Star Wood Capital said the commercial property market is facing a generational change and that it's going to be very, very ugly. We can also take a look at what these small banks are doing compared to the S&P 500. The top blue line here is the S&P 500 year to date, which is up about 6%. The best performing of these small banks on this list is Key Corp, which is down about 5%. The rest of the banks on this list range from being down anywhere between 5% all the way to the worst offender, New York Community Bank, which is down 53% year to date. But it's not just the commercial real estate companies and investors that are worried, and it's not just the market that is worried about the bank's performance as a result. We also see regulators have been talking about this more and more. Recently, Janet Yellen herself said that she expects bank stress due to the losses from commercial real estate. She also said that commercial property is a worry, but regulators are on it. That sounds eerily similar to something another former chairman of the Federal Reserve said about another real estate crisis. At this juncture, however, the impact on the broader economy and financial markets of the problems in the subprime market seems likely to be contained. In addition to that, Jerome Powell, the current chairman of the Federal Reserve, was recently interviewed on 60 Minutes. And he was asked specifically about the current crisis unfolding with commercial real estate impacting small banks. Here's what he said. There's some smaller and regional banks that have concentrated exposures in these areas that are challenged. And, you know, we're working with them. You believe it's a manageable problem? I think it we're appears to be. We're not going to see bank failures across the country as we did in 2008. I, I, don't, I don't think there's much risk of a repeat of 2008. Certainly there will be some banks that have to be closed or, or merged out of, out of existence because of this. 
That'll be smaller banks, I suspect, for the most part. Do you get that? Certainly, there will be smaller banks that will close and will have to be merged as a result, and they will be smaller banks. It's the same pattern unfolding as it has many times throughout history. Banks take deposits, they make loans, either too many loans or too risky loans, either way, too much leverage. Losses pile up, depositors go to withdraw their funds, and the banks collapse. The result is fewer banks left existing as the assets and liabilities are absorbed by the larger banks, less choices for individuals, and more central control over the entire banking and the entire financial system. And the Federal Reserve's behind the scenes bank bailout facility called the Bank Term Funding Program that they opened up last year when Silicon Valley Bank failed, has recently been experiencing a spike in usage. And in just about one month, this facility is scheduled to close. And the Federal Reserve has said it will close according to schedule, which means less liquidity and harder times for those smaller banks that are relying on it. Now, the reality is the biggest problems are always paired with the biggest opportunities. People can make money in bull markets, but they make fortunes in bear markets, as long as you're paying attention attention and you're prepared. So here's exactly how to play this. Number one, don't keep your money in small banks. Keep your cash in high yield savings accounts, in money market funds, in T-bills, and in big banks. Because if you are over the FDIC limit, your money will not be bailed out. It will be bailed in, which means you lose it with the bank. Now, not all of these banks will fail. Some of them will survive and they'll have a huge rebound as a result. Which is why, as the original bankster said, Baron Rothschild, buy when there's blood in the streets. I never recommend recommend getting out of the market, but I do usually recommend staying hedged, especially when risks go up and the market is not pricing in those risks. So you can use very small bets to play the bailout or even play the lack of the bailout. Simple strategies like a debit spread where you buy either a call or a put, and then you sell either a call or a put that is further away from that strike price, further out of the money, will give you a cost-effective way to bet on a large move. With these strategies, the most you can lose is the amount you spend on the trade, and if you pick the right strike prices and the right expiration dates, many of these trades on these banks right now have between a two and a 10X upside. And finally, if you need help learning any of these strategies, that's exactly what members of Heresy Financial University get. A moment ago, we were talking about how to manage your cash. I teach you the most effective way to be able to maintain your liquidity while also getting a return that beats inflation on your cash while also decreasing your risk. Because ultimately that's what you want with your savings. You want an interest rate that beats inflation. You want to maintain that liquidity so you can use it at any time. You don't want it locked up, but you also don't want to be exposed to any risk where you might lose it because after all, that's the point of savings. You can have it when you need it. Members also get access to advanced training material to learn option strategies like debit spreads that we talked about. These are strategies that professionals use because the average retail investor can only make money if the stock they buy goes up and they lose money if the stock goes down. But in reality, with financial education, you learn how to make money in any market, whether the market goes up, down, doesn't move or moves in either direction. On top of that, you get access to the Heresy Financial community, monthly group coaching calls, and much, much more. So at this point, the only question you should be asking yourself is how much money are you losing every single month by not knowing how to take advantage of these moves? So sign up with the link below to get started today. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.